point P is defined. I don't need to know what the elliptic curve is because P knows it. And P knows how to add itself to other points on that elliptic curve. Okay, but notice by, you can already see from the structure of this algorithm, we're always going to be working in the subgroup generated by P because we know nothing else. Then we're going to let T be the least, uh, the greatest integer below 2 square root of Q. And then we're going to compute upper and lower bounds on the Haas interval. Low is the bottom of the Haas interval, high is the top of the Haas interval. And then we're going to let Q be the first multiple of P in the Haas interval. So that's low times P. Just for convenience, just to make the notation really clear, I'm going to let 0 be 0 times P. And it, it's important to do that. I mean, I don't have to write 0. I could have just written 0 times P everywhere, but I have to write 0 times P, not just 0. And the reason is, if I just write 0, again, you have the situation of which 0 do you mean? Do you mean the 0 in Z, the 0 in FQ, the 0, is the zero in some polynomial ring, or the 0 on the elliptic curve? But by writing 0 times P, it's clear that that has to mean the 0 on the elliptic curve. Then we start at the bottom, and while Q is not 0, we keep adding P to it and adding 1 to M. When we're done, we record the M that, that killed P as M0, and then we keep on marching until either we find another point where Q, van another Q that vanishes, or we hit the top of the Haas interval. And then at the end, we either return, um, if we found two multiples, we return the second one minus the first, and if we only found one, we, ref we return the one multiple that we had. And we could check this against a bunch of random points. So I'm just, this is just a code snippet here. It's just generating a bunch of random elliptic curves, generating a bunch of random points on them, and then calling order multiple and making sure that the integer order multiple returns kills the point. That's all that was promised. We weren't promising to get the order on the nose. Okay. Question? Um... Yeah, I think if the integer is, so if we return a unique, if we return any integer, well, if Q is really small, maybe not, but if we return, if Q is large, if we return any integer that's bigger than Q plus one minus two square root of Q, we must be in that case where it's a unique multiple. But as you'll see when we come, when, when we go through Mester's algorithm, it doesn't matter. You don't actually need to distinguish. But if you were trying to write this, make this interface more friendly, maybe you could provide an optional return value that would tell the caller what it is. Yeah, that's a reasonable thing to want to do. Any other questions? Okay. So now, there's a faster way to do what we just did, but before I tell you the faster way to do it, let's jump down to Mester's algorithm, because I want, to see, want you to see how this algorithm is actually used. Okay. So here's Mester's algorithm. <clears throat> So its input, so its goal is to compute the number of FQ rational points on our elliptic curve E to find over FQ. So our input is the elliptic curve E, our output is the number of FQ rational points. So very simple interface. We have one job, we just need to do that one job. We know we have problems with potentially with Qs that are, that are less than or equal to 49. So in that situation, we just farm it out to the algorithm we already implemented our less naive point counting algorithm. Otherwise, we're going to let, because we're going to be working with two elliptic curves, E and its quadratic twist, we'll, let, we'll call the curve we were given, call that E0, and we'll call the, um, the other, the quadratic twist, E1, and which is our non-isomorphic quadratic twist. And our setup is we're going to, our goal is to compute um, the trace of Frobenius mod some integer m, and once that integer m is at least as big as 4 square root of q, we know we have the trace for Frobenius on the nose. So the invariant that's going to be preserved throughout this loop is that the trace of Frobenius is congruent to t mod m. And to make that true at the beginning, we just set m to 1 and t to 0. Every integer is congruent to, is, to 0 mod 1. And we're going to, to know when m is big enough. We want to compare, we want m to make m bigger than w which is the floor of 4 square root of q. That's the width of the Haas interval. And s is going to keep, is just a sign. It's going to be 1 or minus 1. And it's going to keep track of which um, quadratic twist we're on. Okay. And I'm realizing as I'm looking at the pseudocode that I left out a step, which is to switch between e0 and e1, depending on the sign of s. But that'll be clear in the code when we look at it. But our strategy is while m is smaller than w, so we haven't made m big enough, 
we're going to compute an or our order. We're going to call our order multiple algorithm to compute either the exact order of p or a unique multiple of its order in the Haas interval. And I've used the notation, you know, uh, line p line quote as sort of an alternative pseudo order of our point to denote that. And so, but which point P is this? This is going to be a random point on the quadratic twist that we're currently working with, either E0 or E1, depending on the sign of S. Okay. I'll add, I'll fix the notes to include that when I, when, uh, before the problem, set tomorrow, problem session tomorrow. But so we generate a random point on one of the two quadratic twists. We replace, and now we're going, and now we have new information about the trace of Frobenius. Because if you think about the, the on the elliptic curve, the, the number of rational points is Q plus one minus T. And on the trace is Q plus one plus T. And if we think of that equation modulo Q plus one, it's giving in us information about the trace of Frobenius. The trace of Frobenius is gonna be congruent to the number of points on our elliptic curve, which is a multiple of the order of point, of the point modulo Q plus one. And so we're going to incorporate that information, our, our new information about the trace of Frobenius using a sort of a CRT approach to compute the unique integer that is between zero and the least common multiple of M and our, our pseudo order of our, our point P that's congruent to T mod M. It has to be consistent with what we already know. And it satisfies the equation mod Q plus one that we know it has to satisfy in order to be the trace of Frobenius of the, uh, um, in order for the order to be a multiple um, corresponding to the elliptic curve that we're working with. And so, and sometimes we'll get no inform new information. Maybe n divides m, or you know, maybe the, the least common multiple didn't change. But that's okay. Our the the theorem, the Mestre's theorem, or and the the generalization uh, uh, of Cremona and myself guarantees that this will eventually produce a tr uh, an m that's bigger than w and uniquely determines the trace. And once we have that, we return. Either we have to determine what the sign of t should be. It's just an integer between zero and m, but it could be positive or negative, but we know which it must be because it has absolute value at most two root cubes. So if it's bigger, if, if t is bigger than m minus t, then the, the sign has to be negative. Okay. So let me jump to the code where it'll be a little clearer, I hope, what's going on. Okay. Okay, so this is our Mestre point counting function. It takes in an elliptic curve E, and it also takes an optional parameter, which is telling it what function to call to compute this pseudo order. And so the, the, the function that um, we implemented, we just called order multiple, but there's a faster function called order, order multiple BSGS, which stands for baby steps, giant steps, which I realize I'm not gonna have, get time, have time to show you today, but it's a very simple algorithm, and I'll, I'll, I'll have, I think I'll ask you to read it in the lecture notes, and it improves the running time um, to the square root of the size of the Haas interval, so it'll be a Q to the one-fourth time algorithm rather than a Q to the one-half time algorithm. So our default is to use the faster algorithm, but if the caller, and we might want to do this to test, the, the, to compare the two approaches, the caller can specify the order algorithm. So our first step is to figure out what finite field we're working in, what's its cardinality, cardinality Q. Here I even added an assert to say that it really should be a finite field. So it, magma will return zero if we're in a characteristic zero field. And if Q is smaller than 49, we call our less naive point counting algorithm. And now we're gonna set up uh, an array of size two, a, a vector with two elliptic curves in it. And we're gonna use S, this S is gonna oscillate between one and minus one. And we're gonna use the sign of S to tell us which elliptic curve we're working with. Okay. And as instructor, we're gonna set M to one initially and T to zero and W to the width of the Haas interval. And while M is smaller than W, or not bigger than W, we're gonna take a random point on the twist that we're working with, which is sort of awkwardly written as take three minus S and divide by two, that's gonna give you either one or two, depending on whether S is one or minus one. And since magma does its uh, array indexing from one, you really have to, you know, to write the algorithm this way, you have to do sort of this funny arithmetic if, you, if it was zero based. So if you implement this in Sage, this line of code will be a little cleaner. 
But so it's going to take a random point on one of the two quadratic twists, and it's just alternating between the quadratic twists in each iteration. That's all that's happening here. And then it's going to call the order function, which is this parameter that was passed in, to compute a multiple of the order of this random, randomly generated point that's either exactly the order or, the, or its unique multiple in the Haas interval. And then we're going to call Magma's built-in CRT function, which you can give it an array of values, so an array of integers, t and s times q plus 1, and an, and an array of moduli that don't need to be relatively prime. It'll do the right thing. It'll compute the answer will be modulo the least common multiple. And then S, we multiply s by negative 1 to switch the sign of the trace of Frobenius, which simultaneously, because we've set it up with this array, is switching which quadratic twist we're working with. Okay, and then at the end, we figure out the sign of the trace Frobenius by seeing whether the integer we got modulo some m that's bigger than 4 square root of q is, is bigger than it could possibly be, and in which case we, we know we must make the sign negative. And so let's go ahead and run this. And I, I loaded point counting.p because that's where this order multiple BSGS is defined. BSGS is defined. Let's just run our sanity check that it gives the right answers on a bunch of random curves. And now let's just actually time it. And boy, is this algorithm fast. It takes no measurable time when q is 1,000. It still takes very little time, like 10 milliseconds when Q, that was for the slow version. The fast version is still instantaneous when Q is a million, or close to a million. Let's go to a billion. Okay, at a billion, the slower version starts to sweat a bit. So order multiple is the version that I showed you that doesn't use baby steps, giant steps. But the faster version is still instantaneous when Q is a billion. So let's go bigger. I'm not going to try this on the slower version because it would take too long, but even when uh, Q is, say, 2 to the 61 minus 1, the BSGS version, which is, has complexity Q to the 1 fourth, is still giving you an answer in under a second. Okay, so this for... For the question, if your goal were to count points on reductions of an elliptic curve over Q that you wanted to compute mod P for a large sequence of P, say all the P's up to some bound N, well, I can guarantee you your N is never going to be bigger than 2 to the 61. <laughs> and this is the algorithm you should be using all the way along, all the way, along the way. Okay, we'll talk about that more uh, tomorrow. But if you make Q bigger, suppose Q was cryptographically sized, like 2 to the, two to the 255 minus 19, for example, this algorithm would have no hope of counting points on that elliptic curve because even the fourth root of that uh, of that Q is too big. But and it would and in particular would take up too much space. But Scope's algorithm will happily be able to count points on it, and the optimization to Scope's algorithm due to Elke's knack and the SEA algorithm can count points on a cryptographically sized elliptic curve without even breaking a sweat. And we'll talk about that on Friday. All right, I better stop there. Questions for Drew?